Okay, um, so today our webinar is on NX Clinical 4.1. So we're going to go over some of the highlights of the new features in 4.1, um, as well as a short overview of the product. Our presenter today is Dr. Sohail Shams, and I'll hand it over to him so we can begin. Dr. Shams? All right, thank you, Shalini. Uh, good morning, everybody, or afternoon if you're in Europe. As Shalini mentioned, this is a, a rather hopefully short the presentation on the 4.1 release of NX Clinical, and um, which we just released last week. So before starting to go through some of the new features, I thought I'll go over what the NX Clinical system is for some of you who are might not be familiar with the, with the package, and then start and dive into some of the new features. At any point, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and, as Shalini said, put them in the Q&A area, so I will get back to them at the end of the presentation. So just a quick overview of the company. If you're not familiar with Biodiscovery, we celebrated our 20th uh, anniversary last year, so we're actually on 21 years uh, old. Uh, we have been working in the field of cytogenomics for the past dozen years or so and have become the gold standard for CNV. Um, detection and visualization and analysis. Much of that work has been in the research space, generating over a thousand publications in high impact journals. Um, we have been, of course, in the genomic or have had customers that have used the product in the clinical um, area, but we started with NX Clinical about five or six years ago with a specific package for doing, uh, allowing folks to use um, this technology in uh, patient care. And what we offer is not just the software, but we offer software implementation, training, a full end-to-end -end, uh, solution. So why do people adopt NX Clinical? There's, there are multiple reasons, and these are some of the highlights. The number one uh, reason to choose NX Clinical is it really does perform a streamlined case review by using extensive automations anywhere from, from starting from data loading to processing samples to pre-classifying them, filtering them. The entire process can follow a very well-defined SOP for a clinical lab and um, reduce turnaround time and allow your scientists to be able to go through cases um, at a faster rate. Also, it provides a very comprehensive set of uh, resources or knowledge bases, uh, proprietary like OMEM or public like ClinGen or in-house database as you interpret and uh, different variants, they all go in the same database. So it, it allows the clinical users to have at their fingertips uh, access to many different data sources. Third point here is maintain consistency, which is crucial in a clinical environment. Um, you don't want to have a case review done one way in the morning and then in the late afternoon and everybody's tired, something else happened. So uh, because of the automation and the extensive use of audit trails and tracking, you can be sure of the highest quality reports, uh, regardless of who does it and when the reporting is done. Um, also, with the release of NX Clinical 4.0 at ASHE last year, uh, we can allow labs to just do CNVs, AOH, and sequence variants, all obtain all of them from a single NGS assay. So the software uh, can further reduce the cost and turnaround time by getting all the genomic uh, structural variant information with a single assay. And the fifth point here is the integrated analysis view. So this, again, uh, helps in multiple directions from saving time and money um, and improving the quality because you don't have different pipelines. So looking at small structural variants, uh, molecular, and then have a separate pipeline, a set of tools for CNVs. Uh, all the data is in one. So that's another reason um, that NX Clinical has uh, been adopted by many labs. 
Point number six here is platform independent, which is very crucial in my view, because if you think about it, when we started, people were doing this work on bank arrays, and we were supporting them, moved to ACGH, to SNP arrays, and now with NGS. So the customer can use the best available technology at the time, at the right cost, and without losing legacy data, without losing experience that you have with that software, so as opposed to moving from one software that came with the ACGH array to another software that came with the SNP array and then another software that came with the NGS. Uh, it all is within one database and one software. And um, that has been one of the crucial uh, key features of our products uh, from the beginning. And as an example, and the last point here is now we're the recommended uh, software uh, for the Illumina Global Screening Array. Uh, use inside the genetics where I don't know if you're familiar with this platform but it is a um, affordable SNP array technology that can be used uh, alongside either independently for just inside the genetics or integrated with the NGS panels. Okay so just um, reiterating the point that our company's vision has always been platform agnostic and technology agnostic uh, where doesn't matter what technology you're using and what modalities you want to look at, they all reside within the same database to provide the whole picture uh, of the sample. Currently, we're supporting CNVs, AOH, and sequence variants. Over time, we will be adding other components to this. So, how does the NX clinical uh, system work? I just want to differentiate the architecture with what some of you might be familiar with, which is a desktop application, something like if you're using an array like a CHAS or a cytogenomics, uh, where you install the software on your desktop. Uh, here, there is a software that's on the desktop that it's a client that everybody has, but that is more of a viewer. Everything connects to a centralized database, and the database manages all the data, and all the data can be CNVs, AOAs, and sequence variant, all of them within the same database. And they can be organized into sample types, like cancer sample types, postnatals, prenatals. Having a centralized database allows a, a lot of information and knowledge transfer. So this person over here could be the lab technician that's reviewing or starting to review a case. This is the second review. This is the director. They can all communicate um, on the same case within the database, um, as opposed to having individual um, processing. So just a couple more uh, slides here about um, the automation. I think this is a key feature of the product. Um, the first part, it's the variant interpretation assistance, which is one key component in here. Um, as I mentioned, the, the beginning of the process, the whole data loading processing is done, can be done automated and integrated with your limb system. So uh, minimize human error. The next stage is our VIA system, which is an um, AI decision tree um, system that allows you to set up different rules on how variants can be classified, and the software will automatically perform those. So from the data loading to having pre-classified events, it's all automated. And furthermore, all the visualization, filtering, table layouts, can be customized for different sample types and be presented automatically. And by using um, HPO terms, we can additionally filter out events that are related or, or not related to the phenotypes that you have. So the whole system's goal is to make the process more efficient and improve your turnaround time as well as the quality of the results. So this is just an example of some of our uh, active users of the um, NX Clinical, as you can see across the globe. And now I will go ahead and get started. Let me just do a quick check to see if there are any questions that came up. Um, don't see any questions. So now I'm gonna dive right into the software and uh, show you some of the new features. And certainly if you have any questions, Again, type them in, it helps me um, guide it. 
Um, so the, one of the big things that we added in 4.1 was a request from our customers who were doing both array work and whole genome sequencing. So now you can set up multiple processing servers, uh, which we could before, but you can set them up on different queues. So you can set up a queue that runs your whole genome sequencing because that might take several hours to run, depending on your, your hardware, it could be one hour or a few hours, and you don't want your high priority in a few cases or some other array cases that can be done in a minute uh, be tied behind slow-moving um, WGS samples. So you could set that up uh, as a separate queue. So the way this works, which is what I'm going to show you here, um, so this is the NX Clinical System. You have to log in as an admin and have this admin tab. And if you go here, you see there's a new tab called Task Queue. So hopefully this is not too small for people to read. Um, in the Task Queue, you can set up something called, for example, Whole Genome Sequencing Queue. And then set up another queue for uh, high priority arrays, for example. You can set up multiple queues, and then in your sample type tab, you can see that for different sample types, I have lots of different sample types. So let's say my constitutional cytoscan, um, the new one CY chip file, I want to have that run on the high priority queues. And then in the Exxon array one, yeah, so it wants me to save that before moving. But you can see how this would work. So I'm going to discard this and go back and also delete these two guys here as well. So that's uh, one of the new features, especially for high volume, high, high throughput users, I think find uh, they've been asking for that. So we'll find them useful. Uh, the next uh, item on the list is an expanded support for family definitions um, because we do support um, inheritance patent filtering and a number of visualization that lets you visualize trios. What we have done uh, are quite a bit of work in expanding or allowing uh, separation of a label and a meaning. So this can support different languages. Um, as different terminologies, and I'll show you that live. Uh, we've also removed the, or added the affected and unaffected uh, value from the label. So instead of having an unaffected sibling um, as a term, now you have sibling, and then you can specify this as unaffected or affected separately. Um, this allows us to also handle parents where they're either affected or unaffected, and this applies to our dominant and recessive type filtering appropriately. Um, the other thing is uh, previously you would have to have like sibling one, two, three, four, five, um, and the setups visualization was cumbersome to do for each individual sibling, and now they're all visualized the same way. And as I said, a lot of this um, definition is used automatically in our inheritance pattern uh, filtering. Uh, in addition to that, um, or related, we've added something that's been asked for for some time uh, by our SNP array users. So if you have a SNP array or if you're generating SNP data using NGS, uh, where you can, you can calculate the allele frequency using our MSR algorithm, um, we can detect or report de novo CNV and AOH events and say uh, which parent uh, that allele came from. So if it's a deletion, uh, which parent allele uh, got deleted? Or if it's a UPD, which parent um, got duplicated there? So now let me go in here and um, I'll show you an example of that. Um, I got an example from one of our customers in Europe, so I need to find it. Sure. So this is training. So if I'm looking for a link sample ID that starts with Erasmus, Okay. 
if I could smell it correctly. Smell it. Okay. Um, so these, this sample, you can see this is a family that's been um, calling sample ID Erasmus 1, and this is an Illumina 850K array that's been processed, and this is the, the proband. Um, Oh, before showing you this, uh, one second, I want to go back and talk about the linked sample ID here. Um, so what I was mentioning is this is a new tab here. So you could use a label, like in this case, I have a label called index uh, that was used, uh, and that's mapped to a probat. I can add additional labels. So let's say if I'm hot ray. So if I'm doing Spanish, and I can put Padre, and I can say bother. So if the sample has this term uh, in it, the software knows that this is the father um, sample. So I'm going to delete that so not to have it in here. Um, in this case, I think I used the uh, proband as opposed to index. So if you look at this uh, one case, as it's being loaded. Um, again, it's, it works when you have trios, obviously. It will work with a single parent. Uh, it would make an assumption about the other one, but uh, certainly having trios would be much better. Um, this case has a nice big deletion on chromosome three. So if you go to chromosome three, you can see that that's lost. And if you look down here, now I've added this column that's called parent of origin. And for the, the loss event, it shows the father. So if I go here for this loss event, it says the father allele was lost. And if you look, the way it calculates that is looks at the BLL frequency or the probes, SNP probes, um, the BAP for the father and the mother. And you can see there's a, roughly about 5,000 uh, probes in that area. And if I mouse over the individual here, it says that there are 565 informative um, probes that have a paternal origin. So that deletion um, was the father allele that got deleted. Uh, interesting is if you look at the resulting loss of uh, heterozygosity, the AOH with that, uh, it says maternal because what that means is the mother allele is the one that's left, which also matches perfectly. Now, I don't have a UPD, but if, if this was a UPD case, there wouldn't be uh, this loss, and it would just say that's the maternal allele that got duplicated in that region. So hopefully this is clear, and um, you, can, you will find it useful because we've had a lot of requests for this. Um, now, in this one down here where there is a small gain and it has only 31 uh, probes you could see that it shows up as insufficient data because there's not enough uh, SNP probes that are informative or any SNP probe that's informative um, that could let it guess or assign a parent of origin okay um, I think that covers that and now let's continue with the next new feature um, this one i hope i can explain it clearly this is um, a way in my view that allows clinical labs to uh, lower or allow more sensitive detection of cnvs and other types of events without being overwhelmed with too many variants that they have to go through the way this is set, can be set up is to take advantage of the VIA tool, which is the Variant Interpretation Assistant, to pre-classify events into different categories that are benign or pathogenic, and then use a new enhancement to our um, classification filter chain to uh, be able to detect events that are potentially pathogenic. To show you an example of of how this works, let me find this one sample. Um, this sample we will have a full webinar on hopefully later uh, this year because it's a very interesting case, um, which we 
found a pathogenic um, small variant that was validated using other technology and solved this case. But it wouldn't have been possible uh, to detect this uh, variant if we didn't have this new feature. So I thought it'd be interesting to show you this. Um, so this is, well, very quick, this is um, the whole genome plot looks like a microarray, but in fact, this is um, NGS whole exome sequencing data of a trio. And I'm not going to talk about that. And there's all these variants, which I will skip. So I'm going to get rid of the variants and just focus on the CNVs to, to explain. Um, so what we have, if I go back to the table, um, what you see here is we have a filter that essentially based on the classification of the way the events get pre-classified. What it's saying is to remove all the events that are benign or likely benign. So we have a nice way of identifying very confidently what are benign or likely benign variants. Um, but what we added is the ability to now say shortcut all the filter chain by always showing any event that's the most likely pathogenic, pathogenic, or please review. So if I don't use that, you can see that I have no variant. Everything gets filtered because of the 48 events that are coming, um, that's been detected. So let me back up. So I set the sensitivity for this to detect uh, even small uh, variants. So I didn't want to miss anything. So they all for, it detected 48 CNVs, and they all go through this chain. And then there's a size and number of probes. So I, if I just do something like what Affymetrix uh, recommends, like 25 uh, KB and 25 uh, probes, I would, as you can see, I'm removing quite a bit or a bunch of variants. And then as I go down, nothing uh, corresponds to the phenotype because the last step here is correlation with the phenotype. If I remove that, then I got 31 events that have um, nothing to do with the phenotype. So um, I end up with zero, but with, sorry, I forgot to shut this off. Um, with this, classified events, what I'm doing is forcing the software to, to let things pass through. And in this case, this likely pathogenic event, which was uh, the shelf had, um, was identified later as having Rett syndrome, uh, having this uh, mutation or this very small 12K uh, deletion on, on that gene that was detected. So point of this new feature is it's, good now to be able to increase your sensitivity. If you're using our uh, NX clinical uh, software and the fast 2 segmentation, uh, you can increase your sensitivity without being overwhelmed with um, many calls that you have to go through and be able to find uh, potentially pathogenic events. And again, hopefully that's clear. Having one-way audio, it's uh, I'm not sure sometimes if the message gets across or not. Okay, some of the other uh, new features are support for two um, new data types. One is the CY chip file, which is generated uh, by the, the AFI now Thermo Fisher um, CHAS software. So if you wanted to load the data up uh, with CY chip, you could do that. We can also um, load the new Exxon array data so let me just show you that one real quick. So if I go back here and select the AFI exon, I have a single sample that I can show you. So again, it from a software perspective, it doesn't care if this was generated using whole genome sequencing or if it was generated by a 60K array, or in this case, a 6 million uh, probe array, all the functions uh, are here, and you even the parent of origin, since this has SNP data, except there's not as many uh, SNP probes. So it needs to be big. So this is um, essentially the Exxon array 
data that you can load. And as uh, as the array is being advertised to supplement NGS, it works perfectly within NX Clinical because you can use this array to detect small um, CNVs, Dell dupes, and then use NGS uh, for other even smaller variants and lay, lay it on top of this. Okay, now let's go to the next. Um, so I want to first cover uh, things that span both array and NGS. Um, and now I'm getting more towards the NGS features. So we have done additional enhancements to the sequence variant data in the results tab. Um, the first item here actually applies to both sequence variants and uh, CNVs. It will show you the, the frequency of the variant in your internal database, and this gets uh, dynamically updated. So this is, I found it to be quite useful. Um, we've added additional uh, variant annotations for the canonical transcript. Now you can see this at the table level as opposed to drilling down into the various transcripts. And we've separated out the regulatory region variants from the transcripts in the table. Um, we've added a new quality and population frequency filter and uh, expanded the recessive inheritance pattern to also detect compound heterozygous events where the event is a CNV and a mutation potentially. Um, and it takes into account uh, exactly making sure that uh, it's, it is really inherited from each parent. And we've expanded the flexibility on the consequences the, that are considered for the sequence variant events. So um, I want to show you these new features in the live version of the software. So let me go and pick a different trio for that. Um, this is an interesting trio which has a compound heterozygous event. And in this case, we combine, if, you, if I go back to homepage, this is Cytoscan HD um, with the uh, whole exome sequencing data uh, loaded in on top of that. And these are the, the various phenotypes for the patient. Um, in fact, actually, I should show you this one if it wasn't presented before. Um, there's a trio quality check. So if you click on that, if I had done things properly, if there, it checks to make sure that the Mendelian error, so there's only 45 um, errors out of 3,000. So this is uh, the right match. If the parents were mislabeled or anything like that, it will give you an error. So you could double check. This is a required step for the ACMG um, guidelines. All right, so here, the first thing I mentioned was a new column, but before, actually, let me show, click here. This is how you can flexibly add more columns to your table, and the software is quite customizable. As we added more and more um, items that you can add to the table, we also separated in 4.1 the values that are only copy number and allelic events from those that are sequence um, variant events. So it's easier to navigate. One thing that was added was this similar previous cases. So if I go here, you can see that this column now shows me for every variant, every row, um, how many times, so let's sort this. So if I sort based on that, this first variant is pretty much, or this AOH, was only seen here in this sample. Out of my 2,000 cases that I have, uh, it's, it's de novo. And you can keep going down to, down here I have something that's one point, almost 1.5%, 1 28 out of 2,000 cases have this copy number gain. So if I click on that, um, this is the classic way that you saw that number was under the, the little triangle. And now I can, of course I could see what samples they are. Um, having it in the table, like I said, it can allow you to quickly sort and find recurrent versus de novo events. So that's, I think, many people will find that useful. 
um, addition of additional annotations here. So I have them displayed already. You can see that what we had previously, if I could put this over, oh, too many things here. So um, under the sequence variant, we've added this transcript folder. And now you can have the overview, which is this column. Um, or you can also add other information for the canonical form on top. So what, what this means is, for example, uh, here, if I click that, for this variant, um, you can see that it's hitting these three different transcripts for RefSeq and a whole bunch of them in ensemble. And the first one, which is in bold, is the canonical transcript. And if I expand that, I can see the HGF. VS nomenclature, the codon, all of this information. I can add that to the notes field. What we have done is allow you to do predefine, and as you can see here, this information is now available at the, the top level for the canonical form. So it's a lot easier to, to, to look at and sort. So if I just wanna sort, let's say by, by the consequence and go down and look at these um, consequences, I can do that as well. Now, separation of variance, and, okay, so the other part that I talked about was, um, now this only shows you the, the transcripts, and there's another column, which is the regulatory regions, and So, so, for example, this transcript has a frame shift transcript uh, affects these transcripts, and it also affects this one regulatory region where I can, it's a promoter. So that's been separated out. Um, oh yeah, so now we're talking about the, the filter. So we've added a couple of um, new features on the filter chain. So here, if you look at the sequence variant filters, uh, we've, we have, of course, the same, what I showed you with the ability to always show pathogenic, et cetera, events. But this is a new feature here where you can decide to remove uh, variants based on the quality score of the variant, on the read depth. So if you look, um, right now it's 18,500 things are going through. If I filter that out to 20 reads, it goes down to 17,000. If I require really high read depth, 35, I'm now going down to 12,000. Um, I can decide, okay, for the exact um, frequencies, I want any to remove everything that's lower than 0.5, then I can apply that. So that further removes, but then let's say I don't want to remove the finished population, I can uncheck this. So this allows you a great flexibility on the setting up different population uh, filters, uh, live and dynamic now. So I'm gonna remove this. Um, going down, let me, also talk about the interest level while we're here. So in the previous version 4.0, you could set a threshold like this line. So anything that's above this, so the red and the yellow, like um, protein altering variants, uh, deleterious, all of these are allowed through, but anything that's green or blue are filtered out. So one thing you could do is that you could say, well, I don't want to see any conservative in-frame deletions. So you could click that and that removes, or I don't want this to be deleted. So you could check box or you could move this bar up and say, okay, here, anything, I just want the, the red ones and I wanna take these things off. So you can dynamically decide uh, your interest levels and particular consequences that you want to um, allow to pass through the filter. Let me just move this back here. 
Okay, so now uh, let's talk about the inheritance pattern. Since this is a trio case, we have this box, and here I can set up. Um, again, this ties into what we talked about with the family structure. I can look for de novo events, so like this sample just that that event just went away because it wasn't the father, uh, so it's not de novo. Uh, if I click recessive, you can see that it automatically on blocks the compound because it is looking for compound heterozygous and it also looks and it also blocks out the zygosity filter because it's looking for a specific type of variant. In this particular case this was very useful because um, we can detect or we did identify this nice uh, compound heterozygous event where you can see that the mother is has this deletion that's inherited from the mother and the um, small CNV and this small variant deletion from a single exon was inherited by the father. So this fits the, the recessive compound heterozygous um, filter and it shows up, um, goes through the, the filter chain. And um, there are quite a lot of UI improvement that I've seen throughout and I'm kind of going through um, rather quickly, but um, that you will see if you use the software. I'm just going to highlight a few that come to mind right now. So one of the things is showing the percent AOH on the, the home tab. So if you look at this, you can see these are fairly low number. If you have a consanguous sample, you will see these numbers at around 6-7%. Um, so you don't have to dig down into the sample to look at that. Um, the layout uh, has changed, so if you have a lot of factors, so right now I don't have too many, but if you do um, with long text, it looks um, nice in here. The other part is if, if I go to that deletion, for example, and looking at this, it's hard to read. So if you go to the report tab, um, this has been laid out better so you can you can see all the information about that variant all within one place and have all the nice hyperlinks here that that you can uh, use and go um, I think I covered most of the the highlights as I wanted to do in this presentation so I would like to stop at this point and um, see if there are any questions or allow Shalini to also open up the polls Thank you, Dr. Shams. I'm going to open up the polls, but uh, please go ahead and type in any questions that you have. Here's the first poll question. Here is the second and last question. Thank you so much for participating in the polls. Uh, we'll go over to the questions now. <clears throat> Excuse me. First question is, um, I've been filtering the allele frequency at the loading or processing stage. How is that affected by this new filter you just showed? So um, depending on the number of variants, so if you're doing whole genome sequencing and uh, if you don't do any pre-filtering, 
during loading that might end up with about a million or so variant that could overwhelm um, the client. So I would still suggest to do some level of, of filtration on the most uh, benign or, or recurrent um, events. Uh, but what this allows you to do is not to filter out most events, um, just decide at the threshold and then do dynamic filtering later. So. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here, can I customize my default filters based on my preferences for different sample types if I'm not the admin? Um, yes, absolutely. So admin sets up the defaults, but the users can uh, customize their own, so you can set up your own uh, filters. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions here at this time, so we will just close this session. If you do have any other, other questions, feel free to type them into the webinar browser window that will open up for feedback, um, or feel free to email us as well. Um, hope you enjoyed the webinar today, and we hope to see you at a future one. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.